Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the final panel of today's symposium. Sorry for the delay. We've had a few technical issues, but we're sorting them out. Um, excited to, uh, to to have this discussion, a really uh, important and interesting discussion on the future of gene editing and gene therapies. Uh, my name is Rob Annan. I am President and CEO at Genome Canada. Uh, we're very proud of Genome Canada to be sponsors of the af this afternoon's discussion. Uh, this topic uh, certainly is close to our hearts uh, at Genome Canada, so we're really excited to to, to, to take part and to listen in to the great experts we have lined up for the discussion. Um, first, I just want to congratulate the Council of Canadian Academies and the organizers for what's been a pretty phenomenal symposium on this topic. Uh, of course, it stems from uh, an important and impressive report on the approval and use of somatic gene therapies in Canada. So congratulations and thank you to J Janet Ross and the rest of the panel members for their, their really great work on, on, on that thoughtful report. Um, you know, I would love to take time and tell you all about the great things that we're doing at Genome Canada to support research, innovation, and in, in gene editing and gene therapies. Uh, lots happening. We're, we're very lucky in Canada, have phenomenal researchers in all sorts of different areas. Uh, but given uh, the strength of the panel here this afternoon uh, and the interesting perspectives they're going to bring to the table, uh, I think we'll cut to the chase and we'll, we'll get the conversation going. Um, in terms of format here, um, uh, I'm going to introduce all the panelists and then we're going to launch into a discussion. We're going to have, it's going to be a question-based discussion. Um, uh, so you know, we're not going to have presentations. We're going to keep this thing lively. Um, we do have, unfortunately, a few technical issues with the uh, the lineup here. So uh, so uh, rather than um, uh, Dr. Ravitsky and Jay Ingram, uh, they're going to be uh, joining uh, later on virtually. We'll be adding in remarks from them. But I am really lucky to be joined here uh, by three very esteemed uh, panelists. First, uh, Dr. Janet Rossent, who is a uh, Sick Kids Chief of Research Emeritus at the Sick Kids Research Institute, a senior scientist of the Developmental and Stem Cell Biology Program at Sick Kids, as well as Professor of Molecular Genetics at the University of Toronto. Uh, of course, you all know Janet, she needs no introduction, as uh, she's also President, Scientific Director of the Gardner Foundation. Uh, also joining us is uh, Alta Charo, uh, Warren P. Knowles Professor of Law and Bioethics uh, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and uh, she's, she co-chaired the National Academies Committee on Embryonic Stem Cell Research and Human Genome Editing. She's now on the WHO Committee on Global Governance of Genome Editing. So uh, great, uh, great to have uh, Alta with us. Uh, and then finally, uh, pinch hitting this afternoon uh, for our uh, uh, missing panelists is uh, Dr. Eric Meslin. Uh, you know him as President and CEO of the Council of Canadian Academies. Uh, he's also the founding director of the uh, Indiana University Center of Bioethics. Uh, it was also bioethics research director uh, in ethics, legal, and social implications program at the National Human Genomics Research Institute. So uh, just phenomenal uh, crowd here today to talk about the uh, future of uh, gene editing and gene therapies. Um, I just want a couple of quick things. I believe that you can share any questions or comments uh, through the chat function that's associated with the presentation here. So please do so. Uh, you can also um, uh, share your ideas and and contributions via social media. I think there's a hashtag on Twitter, the Gardner Symposium. Uh, and I do want to give a quick shout out to uh, live tweeter extraordinaire, Farah Kaiser, who will be uh, live tweeting from the uh, CCA's uh, Twitter account, uh, or maybe it's the Gardner Foundation's Twitter account uh, during this discussion. So uh, thanks for that, uh, Farah. So um, with no further ado, let's let's jump right into things. And I think Jenna, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose a question to you to get us started here. So uh, the report uh, focused on um, somatic therapies or therapies and gene editing in somatic cells. Uh, you know, sort of the the cells that 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 don't get passed on to future generations. We're not talking about germline editing so far today, but but I want to bring that up and put that on the table here, uh, particularly given technological change, uh, you know, advances being made with CRISPR, uh, reports, um, you know, certainly one report out of China around ger germline editing already. Uh, this is a conversation that that is coming. Uh, I wonder if you could perhaps kick us off and talk a little, yeah. Talk a little bit about how to, um, sorry, I'm gonna pause for a second. We're having technical difficulties.
Okay, so I'm going to ask Janet this question here around talking about making changes in the germline and uh, some of the, the the ethical challenges, maybe even technical challenges that we're going to be facing when we think about germline versus uh, somatic cell uh, editing. Yes, I thought I would bring up germline editing. We've um, studiously ignored it throughout the rest of the symposium, largely because really we were charged with looking at somatic gene therapies and you know the excitement of the science, but particularly on the sort of issues of how to bring those therapies into the clinic and into the population and then there's a very important topic and in fact of course we're going to see somatic gene therapies growing enormously over the next little while particularly with the impact of CRISPR gene editing so CRISPR gene editing for somatic therapies makes accessible treatments for diseases like sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia and even diseases like to show muscular dystrophy which John and Cohen spoke in the last century So, so uh, I think that, that this, sorry, getting interruptions in the background is difficult. Um, so uh, what, that they, what you can do with somatic gene therapy and CRISPR is really address serious genetic diseases, but you're going to do it to the people who have the disease. So the idea about germline editing is if this CRISPR technology is so precise, couldn't we actually do it in an embryo right at the beginning of development and get rid of the bad gene, replace the bad gene, fix the bad gene right in the beginning of the embryo so that the uh, person who grows up from that embryo has, doesn't carry the genetic alteration at all and never has the disease. That's the concept around germline editing. And as you probably know, it's been extremely controversial. And there are many working groups that I've sat on, that Bartha Knoppers has sat on, that Alta Charo has sat on. And at this point, all the indications are that the way we can do gene editing today, although it might work for somatic gene editing for diseases where you're just treating cells in a person, the risks of doing that in the early embryo and any things that go wrong would be carried forward for the rest of that baby's life. And so it's not safe and it's not precise enough and it's not clear that this is really practical at the current time. And that's the general conclusion. I just wanted to put you further in the future. So this is the future looking session. So right now that's true. But what if instead of doing the gene editing in an embryo, and we can only do one at a time and we have to make sure it's the right gene and the right embryo and then put it back. What if we could take stem cells from a person who carries this genetic mutation, grow those stem cells in culture, use CRISPR to fix the gene. So now we have stem cells from the person that now don't carry the mutation anymore, we fix them. So a parent who carries the mutation, we now make stem cells from them and they don't carry the mutation anymore. Now, what could you do with that? Well, in the mouse and beginning in the human, people are now working to make gametes, eggs and sperm from what we call these pluripotent stem cells in culture, can take these cells and push them down the pathways that make eggs and sperm. And in the mouse, it's been possible to make oocytes and cells that can make sperm and be able to fertilize eggs and sperm and generate mice. And in fact, there's been a proof of principle fixing a genetic defect in mice that way. So think for the future. If we could make artificial gametes from stem cells, would we then have the capacity to be able to fix genetic mutations and safely make babies. Now, I raise that as a question because I'll tell you right now, the answer currently is absolutely not. There's a huge number of technical issues along the way here. But I think this is just illustrates that when you're stepping into these areas of complex technologies and complex ethical implications, you have to not just look at what's happening today, but you have to put yourself in the future and try to think down the line what the future is going to look like and start having conversations now on what, how we would deal with those ethical issues coming down the line. Excellent. That's really, I mean, that is really stimulating and uh, raises a lot of questions. Alta, I don't, do you want to pick up on what Jan is talking about here with regards to, you know, the, 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 the potential and challenges around uh, the germline editing? Uh, I think, well, I can, but I thought you wanted me to talk about border crossing. So which is your preference? 
Well, I thought we would, uh, that's, we can talk of, I thought you might want to react to what uh, Janet was saying, but actually this might be, uh, you know, this might also be an important and interesting thread here, which is, of course, as we come up in Canada with our own set of, um, you know, kind of regulations and approaches when it comes to somatic therapies as well as germline therapies, uh, that, that will, you know, sort of happen in a different way than perhaps in some other countries. And so that leads to this uh, questions around, uh, you know, basically medical tourism and, and the possibility of people uh, visiting different jurisdictions in order to access therapies or, or opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, do you want to maybe expand on that topic and, and where you see that going, looking ahead? Yeah, sure. Happy to. And it does include some reference to germline, but it's not limited to that. I think we all know that people move from country to country for a variety of reasons. Some of them are fairly benign. It has to do with scheduling or cost. Um, but there are times where people are moving across borders for very different kinds of reasons. Uh, and in many cases, it can be access to something that's unapproved in their own country, but is approved elsewhere. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It depends on whether it's simply a matter of a difference in the speed of regulatory approval. We're seeing that right now. Uh, Pfizer's vaccine was just approved in the UK. It's not yet approved in any other country, but is uh, submitting applications elsewhere. Um, other times though, uh, it's because there's some particular reason in their own country that this is not going to get approved. And I think in the case of germline editing, that's gonna be the case for many, many jurisdictions. It will be forbidden often for reasons that go beyond safety and, and effectiveness. For example, if we were to move into that future in which uh, Janet speculates we might be able to edit gametes and therefore have a safer or at least more predictable outcome, uh, I think you'll find many, many countries will still, for political reasons or religious reasons, say that this is simply not going to be permitted. And you're going to have people crossing borders to find a country either where it's explicitly permitted that's not true in any country yet, although if I had to guess, I would say maybe Israel in the future uh, because of the lack of any other kind of non-medical obstacles. Um, and yet at the same time, it can also be moving to simply unregulated jurisdictions where they simply don't have control over their science. And we saw this happening frequently in the area of embryonic stem cell research and therapies over the last 25 years. We've had a number of jurisdictions that became notorious for basically allowing people to sell snake oil. And I think in both germline and in somatic editing, we are going to run the same risk of snake oil clinics. Um, in germline, because it will be forbidden in many, many countries. Uh, for somatic, because I think that there are applications that are about treating serious conditions and diseases already in clinical trials, but where the risk benefit balance is not favorable for things that are more cosmetic or more uh, discretionary. And I think there a lot of the concern is that there may be some kinds of interventions like those for muscular dystrophy that could conceivably be altered in order to provide, uh, for example, some effort to increase your muscle capacity, even if you have no particular disorder. That's scary because whether or not it's true, it may be easily advertised. And as we know, advertising doesn't respect borders. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it is a real focus for the World Health Organization Committee on Global Governance and Genome Editing to try to anticipate this and to figure out ways that governments can try to coordinate their regulatory systems. Not that they have to all have the same view about the acceptability of any particular therapy, but that they need to anticipate this. They need to be able to take some actions uh, with regard to advertising within their jurisdiction uh, for things that really are false or misleading, uh, beginning to provide education for their citizens if they know that they're at risk of having people travel to places where they're getting things that simply aren't ready uh, or things that are simply not safe. Uh, germline and cosmetic somatic editing, I think are probably top of that list. Excellent. Thanks, Alta. Really interesting perspective. I see Jay has joined us. Jay, I'm going to come to you in a second. Uh, I just want to first just uh, go to Eric. Um, so, uh, you know, Eric, bioethicist, listening in to talk about, uh, you know, germline editing, uh, snake oil clinics, uh, uh, medical advertising across borders. I'm sure that's got a lot of your spidey sense uh, kind of like tingling and, uh, you know, maybe sending out some warning shots. What are you thinking about when, when you think about these kinds of issues and looking ahead to the future? 
Um, thanks, Rob. I think there's two things that immediately come to mind. One is how much of this have we heard about before or thought about before? Are there some lessons from the past that we should uh, try to not only remember, but actually try to learn from? So Alta mentioned 25 years ago, we can go back in, in groups of tens or twenties when it comes to decades and pick your favorite genomic technology or reproductive technology that caused the same kind of alarm or concern, whether it's from the, um, the precautionary principle side of those who are especially worried about safety or about the, the policy or regulatory environment that was uh, at any one time was uh, um, well uh, prepared, not well prepared. I mean, think of the IVF debates of the um, early and mid 1970s, uh, the early gene therapy debates of the early 1980s, and then onward through embryo research uh, to somatic cell nuclear transfer cloning, uh, stem cell science. So the, the one uh, antennae of my spidey sense, Rob, is that there have been many case examples where the worry about do we know what is safe? Do we have an adequate uh, ethics and governance regime in place to deal with it in our country, wherever we might be, and how do we plan for the future? So there's actually a lot to, to go on. We don't have to start from scratch. I think the interesting second antennae uh, that I would uh, waggle here is um, the kind of speed and pace of change that we're experiencing. Some of it almost ironically um, analogous to what happens with our current situation with COVID, where we see infectious disease uh, transmitting faster and faster around the world because of global transportation. So Alta's comment about borders and the like, also not a new point, but I think what we're seeing now is, uh, and remember she used the word coordination, um, a, a important term about how countries might wish to talk to each other and design uh, collaboratively what regime they might wish to each adopt. This is where the, the it gets kind of uh, tricky. I'll, and I'll leave this one last item on the on the table with respect to the speed and pace issue. There is uneven development and diffusion of these technologies across the global north and the global south. Some of these discussions, in fact, the majority of the discussions, not all of them, but the majority of the discussions are still taking place in the global north in the economically developed uh, countries that have the resources and power to build and design and deploy these, these technologies and therapies and actually have the, the, um, the privilege and liberty to debate many of the, uh, the ethical issues. Uh, if we don't address the global south and those kind of justice questions about access and what will we do with these technologies, then we might find ourselves forgetting the lessons that we should have learned 30 or 40 years ago. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Eric. Really interesting perspective. Uh, so it looks to me like we've been joined by one of our other esteemed panelists, Jay. Uh, sorry, we've had some technical challenges, but it's great to have you aboard. A uh, quick introduction uh, for someone who, who may well need no introduction. Jay Ingram, of course, is well known to many of many of us as a science communicator, uh, former host of both uh, Quirks and Quarks and Daily Planet, the author of 19 books. He chairs the science communication program at the Banff Center and is a is co-founder and board member of Beakerhead, a really super cool arts and engineering mashup uh, based in Calgary. So Jay, um, thanks. It's great to have you here. Uh, you've been able to listen in a little bit about these first couple of topics around, you know, engineering, um, you know, sort of the germline and thinking about, uh, you know, how gene therapies may well uh, be used in that way, uh, as well as this question around medical tourism, which isn't necessarily new to, to gene therapy, but will create, a, you know, sort of set of, of new and, and different sorts of challenges there. Um, as someone who does a lot of science communication with the public, uh, you know, what, what do you think of when you think about these kinds of topics? Uh, I go back to thinking about how inadequate science communication these days generally is to address these kinds of issues. I don't want to be throwing shade on, on you know, our discussion of the future, but uh, I would just ask everybody to consider this. Uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, we have seen the appreciation of expertise, the respect for science, and the ability to communicate I'm getting an echo. 
but I'll just keep talking, um, to com- fall apart, basically. And, uh, you know, we didn't, in a way, we didn't see this coming. But I think if you take the Trump era, which kind of distinguishes what I'm talking about, and you had looked at science controversies in the years coming up to Trump being elected, you would have seen the same kind of issues writ small. So for instance, a, a, a science controversy like GMOs, are they safe to eat or not? Uh, what about vaccination? What's clear in those debates, if you want to call them debates, is that scientific data plays little or no role. People with uh, strong opinions on either side of those issues, and you could include nuclear power, you could go on and on. People with the strongest opinions are not listening to data. They're not considering every new scientific paper and reformulating their opinion on that basis. They instead come to the table with their opinions formed based largely on social... Sorry, that's my dog guarding me, okay. With social and cultural attitudes that would enable you to predict their stance on any so-called scientific controversy. The problem we're in, and we've been in for a long time, and we must, I really apologize for my dog, uh, we, we must really address is we don't know how to deal with off-road attitudes like conspiracy theories about Bill Gates implanting 5G uh, you know, devices in a vaccine. We're just as science-oriented people, and I'm not a scientist, I'm a communicator, we're just, we're not ready to deal with that. And the problem is, the reason we are not, is that there's a lingering attitude that, oh, if we present all the data transparently, then people who are opposed to what we're talking about will change their minds. They won't. And so the difficulty that I find in my role here in this discussion is, because we're asking to look into the future, Nobody would have predicted, you know, 300 people in downtown Calgary with an anti-masking parade. Are you kidding? That's just something we never, uh, uh, never thought to accommodate. So when we're talking about future issues as we are, I think what's really important as we go along is to think, how do we better prepare the communications at every level, country to country, medical expert to politician, CEO to patients, whatever, we have to be a lot better at it. And I will probably come back to this uh, the next time I round, but I'll leave it at that for now. Excellent. Thanks, Jay. Uh, that's a really good perspective. It's, you know, and it doesn't matter, you like me, it doesn't matter how many times I tell my dog, you don't have to bark at everyone that comes to the door. The evidence isn't enough for them. They're just going to so do it anyway. So there's, there's a lesson and there I for can sure. See you. So the, um, okay, so I have a question, maybe I'll come to the the whole panel here. I want to get perspectives on. I think it's an important one. And um, it's been alluded to a little bit here when we think about, you know, whether it's the conversations going on in the global north versus the global south, uh, the challenges that come along with, say, medical tourism and kind of access and equity and so on. And this is just kind of a broad-based question, looking ahead, looking forward, and uh, wondering about kind of the challenges we're going to be facing, whether it's on the somatic side, certainly, but also on the germ line side, when it comes to these new therapies, what are some of those challenges going to be for issues around, say, social justice, diversity, uh, inclusion, accessibility, and so on? So, uh, Eric, maybe I'll ask you to k- kick us off on that, but I, I would like to get uh, different perspectives on this. Sure. I think your um, summary of what the challenges are, are kind of now a well-worn thread um, in policy, bioethics, the scholarly academies. So we're, forgive the analogy, but, you know, during the, the goal of the Genome Project was to map and then sequence the, uh, the letters of the human genome. And I think we've been doing the same sort of thing on the, the bioethics and policy front. We've been doing a pretty good job of mapping, you know, staking out the locations or the, the names of some of these big topics. And we started to sequence them a little bit, trying to figure out what they're made of. So, you know, it's not enough to say the words social justice and have that mean the same thing to everybody. Um, 
access issues are very different. Fair access to affordable medicines is one version of a justice question, but so too is whether people are going to be discriminated against based on who they are, where they live, um, what their employment status is, or in the case of our U.S. colleagues, whether they're employed and therefore have um, insurance coverage. So the idea of a big tent topic like social justice, uh, I don't think does enough um, service or does enough work to what some of the, the granular issues are. Uh, some people are still starved. Many people are starving in the world right now or have don't have access to, to clean water. In fact, we have a similar problem in Canada that we don't like to talk about, that not everyone can get access to clean water. And yet here we are talking about very high uh, cost, um, perhaps even insurmountably high uh, and costly medicines. So I think the topic needs more attention and not just at the kind of conceptual philosophic level, but who gets to participate in decisions is as much an issue about of justice as whether we are fairly allocating the scarce resource like a technology for uh, arising out of a genomics lab. And the more we talk about it, and in fact, make the tent larger about who can be uh, participating in that discussion, I think the better off we'll be. It may be very uncomfortable because the tent might be quite large, uh, but I think that's the kind of progress we have to start making intentionally. Um, otherwise, we're still going to be congratulating ourselves. Uh, and this is me speaking. I'm not sort of speaking on behalf of CCA or the report. This didn't come up in, in the gene therapy report or the, or the other projects. But I do think this is time to have a serious conversation about what it means to uh, engage in a public conversation, who should be in the room, uh, and what some of the, the risks and benefits are of, uh, of unequal access and, and unequal care. Yep. Sorry, who is that? That was Alta? Yes, sorry. Oh, you can't see, I guess. Um, yes, it's Alta. Um, there, there are two different kinds of equity issues that we might want to separate for conversation. One is simply where it is we're paying attention, because frankly, for most of the world, the far more important areas of application are going to be in the agricultural sector, uh, in plant and animal editing, so that you can adapt to climate change and provide uh, a sustainable kind of food supply for those parts of the world uh, because there's still food insecurity, there's still issues around, as he said, at clean water, et cetera. Um, and so part of it's that that's just not as sexy as the human applications and doesn't get the same kind of attention. Um, the second, though, is when you are talking about the human applications, uh, there's a tremendous role to be played by funders uh, and regulators. Uh, right now, for example, in the area of sickle cell, we have clinical trials already developing that use an in vitro technique that require removing cells from the body, editing them, and then returning them. Now, this is an incredibly uh, technologically sophisticated and expensive process, and it may possibly be useful for populations here, for example, in my own country in the U.S., but if you're talking about where sickle cell is really endemic, it's going to be West Africa. And so what we need is to encourage research into uh, more logistically and economically feasible ways to do this. For example, by doing in vivo editing, which is a different area of research that you'd have to encourage through your funding decisions, as well as through your regulatory bodies setting themselves up to figure out how to deal with risk benefit analysis for a different form of the technology. Uh, and we can do things like that. Um, regulatory agencies in Canada, the US, Europe, all of us have agencies that have developed imperfect partial incentives for underexplored areas like orphan diseases, tropical diseases. Uh, and I don't know that we've focused enough attention yet on how genome editing could be fit into that kind of model of finding ways to encourage research in areas where it's needed, but where the populations couldn't necessarily afford it or do it at a scale that would make it uh, commercially attractive to the major pharmaceutical or other industries. 
Excellent. Thanks for that, Alta. Um, really, really great perspective. Uh, so now with impeccable timing, the technology has been worked out and uh, we've been joined by Dr. Vardit Ravitsky. Uh, great to have you, Vardit. Really quickly, just to say that Vardit's Associate Professor of Bioethics at the School of Public Health at University of Montreal. Um, and this is right up your alley, Vardit, I know. Uh, do you want to weigh in a little bit on, on how you see some of the issues around social justice, diversity and inclusion in, in these technologies? Yeah, so uh, because of the technological issues, Eric and Alta already picked up many of the points. You did a great job, guys. Um, so I think the issue of uh, justice and access to the hopefully upcoming therapies is huge, as well as discrimination based on what types of uh, conditions we try to maybe eradicate from the human gene pool uh, using gene editing that Eric mentioned, that another, that's another issue. Um, two issues that are very, very uh, uh, particular to gene editing. Uh, one is the issue of the research burden. So where do we do this research? Um, we need uh, to, to, do, to edit eggs and embryos, we need uh, egg donors. We need access to uh, ova. And that is often an overlooked issue because uh, the places where we go to get this very precious resource is sometimes uh, low-income countries where women maybe donate for money. Uh, are they protected locally uh, by the research ethics um, guidelines uh, where they are in their nations? That's a huge global issue of justice that is way ahead of the uh, therapies we're hoping to achieve. It's about the burden of the research itself. So how do we protect women who are uh, critical uh, for this research to happen? Here in Canada, we ban this research completely, uh, which on one hand protects maybe egg donors, but on the other hand might cause uh, reproductive tourism in the future. Uh, the point that Alta was making, if Canadians don't have local access to therapies because we didn't do the research to develop them, will they have to go elsewhere? So this whole cluster of issues around uh, the burden of research uh, in light of justice considerations is one element. And the other is really pretty science fiction-y. And that's the issue of justice in, rela in relation to future generations. So when we are editing germline, uh, the germline, these modifications will pass on to the descendants. And the issue becomes how do we follow up with uh, those that we have created based on the technology to make sure uh, that they're in good health, that uh, the editing <laughs> anticipated. Um, so first of all, just take into account that we're experimenting on future generations. And second of all, develop mechanisms for including these future generations in follow-up longitudinal research, but without coercing them to be to remain our research participants. So that's an entire cluster of issues about justice and inclusion that we're going to have to figure out if we're going to edit the germline. Indeed. I'm not sure, Janet, there's been a lot said there. Anything that you want to weigh in on this issue? Well, I, I certainly agree with a lot of what Alta said about the and Eric about we have to think beyond our own borders and beyond the, the north, the developed north, and think about how these uh, applications can be implemented in the global south. And often I've, I've raised this several times every time I sit on a committee about germline editing, I go, you know, this is a, a first world problem. This is really only going to be potentially applicable or accessible to a very small number of people and unless and until we really see changes in the whole way reproductive technologies occur. And then it's pointed out to me that in many ways, if we want to see something have an impact in the developing world, we do have to develop it here first because we have the resources to do the deep research, to do the background, to do the implementation, the commercialization. But then we have to have mechanisms to translate that into something that can go, go global. And if we think back to HIV, where retrovirals were, antiretrovirals were developed, obviously, in, in the north. Now, it took some political and uh, um, philanthropic pushing, but in the, in the end, companies were ended up giving, basically giving away their retrovirals to the developing world. And I think what you're seeing with gene editing, particularly for diseases like beta thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, which have huge impact 
uh, in the global south, that there is a push from Gates, actually, again, and the NIH to start thinking now about exactly what Bath has uh, Alta said, which is to put to really develop a cheap, easy, in vivo gene therapy for those diseases. And the scientists, that's a sort of good scientific challenge. You know, in fact, in the COVID era, several of the CRISPR people, uh, Fang Zhang, uh, Jennifer Doudna, they've all pivoted their research and developed quick, cheap, easy tests for COVID. And in fact, they will be ready and willing to develop quick, cheap, easy gene editing for some of these diseases. So I, I think that we do have to sort of do that coordinated global thinking about uh, gene editing. That's somatic. I'm not talking germline in this case, but somatic gene editing. Right. Okay. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Jay, how about you? Like this issue around kind of equity and um, you know, sort of inclusion when it comes to these products, uh, these therapies uh, are a big question. Uh, maybe you want to weigh, do you want to weigh in on that, uh, on that topic? I want to weigh in on a topic, <laughs> but maybe not exactly that because, and I'm glad that uh, Janet brought up COVID because, and, you know, forgive me for repeating somewhat of uh, what I've already said, but uh, nobody could have anticipated the uh, ignoring the scientific evidence about COVID and in fact uh, reacting uh, publicly against it. And, and this is really my point that um, there are lots of issues that discussed by the panel really, that I think have like tourism, like the issue of money, money would a government uh, be willing to spend on individuals in its jurisdiction if the amount of money isn't worked out, uh, you know, as was being discussed earlier today in the one of the other panels. Um, we just, we just, anticipate it. Now, uh, you know, COVID communication, I mean, there have been all kinds of people publicly saying what I believe and probably most of you believe to be the right thing to say. And yet, frankly, there's a portion of the population that even listening to that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to beat this to death, but I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, about a month ago, November 2nd, there was an article by a preeminent medical man who likened those people who believe in conspiracy theories about COVID to um, a couple of kinds of dementia, frontotemporal dementia and Lewy body dementia, and how in those uh, medical cases, incoming sens sensory information is degraded and the ability to make judgments on what sensory information actually comes in is also degraded with the result that people become delusional. If you're wanting to start a discussion with people who aren't on side about COVID, likening them to dementia patients is probably not a good place to start. The author then went on to point out that social media has been largely responsible for the spread of uh, COVID conspiracy theories, and then offered this remedy. And the remedy was scientists, clinicians, and public health experts should engage in dialogue on issues of public health. They already do, such as masks, vaccines, and medications. Yes, they do. Accessible presentation, part of every medical office and healthcare system. I believe that's also true. Attractive and accessible websites that post reliable data on health should counteract the false narratives. That none of that is true, what was written there. Plus, the point is, after identifying social media as one of the critical factors in allowing misconceptions ranging all the way to conspiracy theories to flourish, there's no suggestion in this article as to how you might combat that. In fact, the writer really thinks that got to start good science education in childhood and then continue through the lifetime. That is not a remedy. That just shows how unprepared we are for anti-science, if I can call them that, uh, demonstrations and come from directions we hardly knew existed. And so as we look forward to many of the issues that we're already discussing here now, we've got a lot of ground to cover to improve our communication especially to the general public about these issues. 
That's great. Really important perspective, Jay. Thank you for that. Um, so listen, let's move to kind of the, a big picture question. And we are, you know, we are kind of heading towards the end of this panel. It's been a little interrupted with technical challenges, so it's felt a little compressed. But um, I do want to spend a couple minutes here. We've probably got another 10, 15 minutes left. So I want to cast our minds ahead. If we think ahead to say the year 2030, so we're looking 10 years into the future. This this panel is about the future of gene editing and gene therapies. We've, we've kind of meandered around a lot of different areas, but when you turn your eyes ahead to those, uh, to the year 2030, you know, where, where do you see us going uh, for gene editing? And, you know, for for this year, you know, I, I, I kind of open the floor to someone who wants to kick us off if, if they have a vision of where we're going to be 10 years from now. Um, anyone want to share their, their thoughts off the bat? Saying, Janet? Oh, I'll start by saying that uh, whenever I'm asked to predict what we're going to happen 10 years ahead, I always say I have no idea because if I stepped 10 years back, this sort of follows on Jay's point really, I stepped 10 years back and asked, okay, what would we be doing in 2020? In, in, just in the area of, of uh, gene therapy and gene editing alone, let alone more broad-based issues around pandemics and everything else, I would never have predicted where we are today. So I'll start off by saying I don't know. However, if we just focus on uh, gene editing and gene therapies, I do think we're on a very strong and very fast path to see real developments of gene editing and gene therapies that are going to have some impact on some major diseases. And we'll see those implemented in the northern, in North America and Europe, and hopefully we'll also by, by that time in 2030 have started to see how gene editing can actually be used in a, a cheap and easy way because the components of CRISPR are actually very cheap. You've just got to package them in something cheap as well. So I think there are real possibilities to have impact on some of the devastating genetic diseases. So that's the part I can put a fairly narrow <laughs> circle around. If you want me to go beyond that and say, where else will gene editing go be working? It's going to work in agriculture. It's going to work in a number of areas. What the downside that I also predict is that gene editing, somatic gene editing, as Alter already said, we will see it being used for genetic enhancement, particularly in the athletic uh, environment. Athletes are apparently willing to take anything or do anything to improve their performance. And I don't see how we can really prevent uh, the, what will be illegal, but prevent the illegal use of gene editing approaches for enhancement. Excellent. Thank, thanks for that, Janet. Um, Alta, how about you? Where do you see things going 10 years down the road? Well, since I'm a professor and not a biologist, I'm even more anxious to say I have no idea than Janet was. Um, but there are some application areas that we've not talked about that are still less well developed, and I think the next 10 years we'll see more development. One of them is in epigenetic editing, which allows for uh, temporary reversible changes. I think we're going to see a lot of interest in that, starting with the military, uh, because of the potential there to be able to temporarily uh, help war fighters either resist radiation threats or resist pain. And uh, then we'll see those kinds of things moving out into the civilian sector, radiation hardening, for example, for cancer patients in order to preserve as many organs as possible while they undergo necessary therapies. Um, and reverse engineering of it to make certain cells more vulnerable, let's say, to radiation so that you could be more effective in those therapies. But I think it may very well start with the military. Um, I also think we're going to probably see some development in the area of in utero somatic editing as a as an alternative to germline editing. Uh, if you've got a disorder that is difficult to treat postnatally because it affects many body systems uh, or it's a blood brain barrier problem, uh, editing in utero uh, might serve a, a, a valuable kind of intermediate function. And uh, there's already very interesting research going on in mice, but we're only at the very front end of thinking about it for humans. And it's another example of something where many countries will not allow this in part because of their rules governing pregnancy and abortion and uh, where you might see development very unevenly around the world. Uh, so for that, 
I'd say there are some areas of application or areas of research that will begin to blossom in the next decade. Wow, really interesting. Thanks, Alta. Uh, Vardpeet, how about you? Where do you see things 10 years down the road? Um, so the other panelists have mentioned uh, somatic interventions, and I agree, I think we'll see great medical progress in that area, and obviously in agriculture uh, and on animals. But I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that what has happened two years ago in China and is being contemplated currently in Russia will happen quite a few times before 2030. And what I mean is that uh, scientists, clinicians will decide to go ahead and uh, make reproductive use of germline gene editing and actually bring about the birth of babies uh, that are edited to uh, prevent a variety of conditions, some uh, severe diseases and some disabilities, as in the case of uh, hereditary deafness. Um, I think we lack uh, international regulatory frameworks that allow us to uh, keep these initiatives uh, at bay. And I think there are countries with less uh, enforcement or less developed regulatory frameworks that where people will just go ahead and do it. Um, I think the, the lack of uh, international harmonization or uh, mechanisms in this area is a huge problem. Everybody acknowledges that, but nobody has real solutions. Uh, so my uh, prediction would be that we will actually have a small cohort of genetically edited babies within 10 years that we will have to study. And uh, I think that that won't be a wise thing. But the least we, we should do in that case, if that happens, is to study uh, those uh, individuals in depth so that we can at least learn lessons for when we are actually ready to responsibly and ethically implement the technology on the germline. Excellent. Thanks, Vardit. And thanks for going out on a limb there. That's really, I think, an important consideration. Eric, how about you? 10 years down the road, what are you thinking? Um, I'm sorry, half of this is what might happen and, and half is what I'd like to see happen. So I don't know how to divide up my wish from what the, the crystal ball is. But I think we've had too many examples. Uh, the COVID example with how the globe has responded um, as an entity and the individual country pieces have responded. I think in 10 years, this is the slash hope and prediction. I think we're going to see a new way of having these um, regulatory governance conversations um, truly uh, mediated through uh, not only the web, but through uh, legislatures. I'm just not convinced that the way we're doing things now is as productive as it can be. So I think that in 10 years, we'll, people will either be so fed up with uh, different ways of, of uh, offering input that there'll be another one. I don't mean there's going to be a global science court or a global ethics court or anything of the nature. Uh, but I think there's going to be something new. Ten years is far enough away, but close enough to see um, a kind of dissatisfaction growing into more of a, a participatory uh, conversation. That might be frightening. It might be exciting. But I don't think we're going to be having the same discussion in the same way. The, the Internet genie is out of the bottle. The many media platforms are out of the bottle. Um, the second is also a hopeful and possible, and we might see, um, and this was hearkening back to, in fact, the, the earlier panel this, this morning, about the nature of relationships between the public, private, and philanthropic sectors. We now have a, a fairly good body of examples where these relationships, Janet mentioned one with respect to um, HIV, uh, born of the placebo control trials of the of the late 1990s that led to frustrations regarding who was getting access to medicines tested in one country and deployed in another. So I think we may see more innovation, more collaboration um, across the, the many um, parts of, of, of civil society, the, the public sector, including universities, the private sector in all of its many forms and the philanthropic sector. Perfect, thanks. Eric uh, and Jay, how about you? You, you know, it's uh, there's maybe a little, um, you know, uh, kind of concern about how things are right now in terms of public perceptions around COVID and so on. Where do you see that moving in the next ten years? Um, I think I.
should start by saying that, you know, I think uh, many of the advances that have been discussed um, might be not controversial in the same way that a COVID vaccine has been. But, you know, I, I appreciate uh, Alta and Vardit's comments because they, you can see where controversies would arise within countries, um, sometimes influential people. I mean, before the series on Netflix, The Crown, people actually respected Prince Charles. And he did recently say that um, gene editing, genetically modified organisms are entering into the realm of God and should remain the realm of God. So whether you think he's worth listening to or not, you can easily imagine that thoughts like that could intrude. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I, I think that many of these issues, they're super exciting. And I think that uh, as long as communication takes the same pace forward as the technologies and techniques, then we're okay. I'll just leave you with one thought though. There was a really good analysis of Facebook pages of pro-vaccine and anti-vaccine people. And what they showed was, even though pro-vaccine, there are many more pro-vaccine pages on Facebook than anti-vax. But when you look at how they connect to people in the middle who are as yet undecided, the anti-vax pages have many more contacts within that group. So they are linking up to people who are undecided. They are probably deluging them with information that that might appeal to some of those undecided people. So it's a, we're in a situation with the anti-vax uh, situation that um, we're not doing a good job of looking at how social media work and using that to our benefit. They also did a, a, a projection and nicely out to 2030, which is what we're talking about, and said with current trends, there will be more anti-vaxxers on Facebook than there are pro-vaxxers. Now that's anti-vax and that, and that definitely has some of its own unique qualities. But all I would say is we've got we've to make, I think, a major improvement in how we assemble and communicate to people uh, so that you know, when 2030 comes and we've got a, a glorious smorgasbord of gene therapy options available to us, we'll know how to talk about them. Great stuff, Jay. Thanks. I think a really important perspective. Uh, and if I can just abuse my my role as moderator for a sec, I'm really am lucky at Genome Canada to see a lot of very early stage stuff come through. And I'm I'm very excited about a lot of the potential with you know Jay's kind of warnings mm. in a sense, notwithstanding yeah, about the environment they go into. Just but I do think as well that you know I just want to flag it came up a little bit, but looking beyond the world of kind of human health therapies um you know th there's a whole other universe out there around um you know agriculture whether, whether it's climate adaptation and mitigation and food security uh biomanufacturing the way we can use the same technologies and tools in synthetic biology to reinvent how we build things uh and you know thinking about uh environmental conservation uh food security for for those in the north there are so many different avenues that these kinds of technologies are going to open up that thinking ahead to the future in jazz point is hard to predict but it's hard not to also be optimistic about a lot of the the potential so um with that i think i'll just i'll wrap up here i want to thank the, the the panelists i want to thank the audience i know that uh, especially off the beginning there was a little kind of technical difficulties uh you know in a way it's a reminder i guess with new and powerful technologies uh whether we're talking about CRISPR or, or video conferencing uh they they work really well but we shouldn't uh we have to be careful about hubris because some sometimes along the way we should uh you know we'll run into challenges um but i do want to thank the panelists for their time and their perspectives i think it was a really fascinating discussion one that's uh, really the, the beginning of the conversation uh that we're going to be having over those next 10 years so thank you to them for their time and energy and with that i'm going to pass it back to uh to eric to wrap things up here